Welcome to Your Family Dog, a podcast dedicated to helping families love living with dogs. Here are your hosts, Julie Fudge-Smith and Colleen Pilar. by Dr. Trisha McConnell. She was on a previous episode where we talked about fear and trauma, and that was a really good episode, and we delve into a lot of really tough, heavy subjects, and we decided we wanted to have a little more fun because Dr. McConnell, if you don't know, is, to use Julie's term, the Arnold Schwarzenegger of the dog world. She's got a PhD in zoology. She's been doing animal behavior and improving relationships between people and dogs for more than 25 years. And she's written many, many, many wonderful books, the most recent of which to be released is a paper da- paperback edition of The Education of Will. So thanks so much for joining us today, Tricia. You know, I get compared to Ar- Arnold Schwarzenegger um, daily. Daily. <laughs> daily. Uh, actually, actually not. <laughs> really, that's actually the first time um, I, I just I don't know what to say. But but I'm going to take that as a great compliment, and I will tell that to my Pilates trainer tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was talking to my fitness trainer and trying to come up with a you know she's looking at me. I'm like, it's like. If Arnold Schwarzenegger came, you know, and she's like, <laughs> I said, she's the Arnold Schwarzenegger of the dog training world. Really, seriously, this is so cool. So we're very excited to have you here. And I'll try it's really hard not to, to call you. Thank on. you. <laughs> so one of the things is that people tend, to, when I say I'm a dog trainer, I don't know if you find this, say, oh, that must be so much fun and what a great, happy life. And I'm like, yeah, you know, if you want to smell like liver for a good part of the day, it's the job for you. Um, <laughs> so I was wondering if you had any um, any thoughts came to mind about the, the glamour aspect of dog training that you've experienced. Oh, yeah. You know, um, I my, my description is that I think people envision us spending our days running through fields of daisies with golden retriever puppies. Yes. Right? <laughs> that, you know, that's mm-hmm. what we do. Um, and it's sort of one big oxytocin hazed you know, <laughs> scene with music playing in the background. And you know, and the fact of the matter is, um, it's not. And it's it's not that it's not just not glamorous. I mean, you know, liver <laughs> liver stinky liver pockets and dog poop and you know, yeah, mm-hmm. there's all that. There's yeah, all that. There's also, you know, and I know this happens to you too, and it happens to every trainer, and it happens, um, I think, especially to behaviors who specialize in aggression, as I did, is I was prepared for danger. I was prepared for the fact that I'd be working with dogs who bit people and that I was physically going to be in a small room with dogs who were dangerous. I was mostly prepared for that, and it, 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 it didn't put me off. What I was not prepared for was the emotional pain and agony that would happen in my office on an almost daily basis. Right. People yes. Whose dog yes. Is, I know you guys, family dog. I know you deal with this. It's like people who are fighting because the dog bit their mm-hmm. five-year-old son, and he wants, you know, or she wants the dogs put down, and uh, the partner or spouse wants the dog um, rehabilitated and worked with. Um, and just, you know, the amount, I, we love them so much, and that makes mm-hmm. them so vulnerable. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's not just not glamorous, but it's also really emotionally very hard. I would go home just exhausted, you know, just really mm-hmm. tiring. Now, even even on my blog, The Other End of the Leash, um, I've written a couple of blog pieces in years past about when is the time to put a dog down for a behavioral problem. There, they are. They've had hundreds and hundreds of comments, and I I approve comments every day. And so often I read these heartbreaking stories of people who have to decide about whether to put a dog down for severely aggressive behavior and the trauma they've gone through. So because we love them so much, you know, it 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 means that there's a lot of pain and heartache. So wasn't this supposed to be the happy, funny? This was <laughs> supposed to be fun. <laughs> I am so sorry. But so, that is an answer to your question, is we are not always running through fields of daisies with golden retriever puppies. So I, I have a story that has um, that is actually a story on me. It relates to a sheep herding demo. This is years ago. 
um, my friend, partner, colleague, Nancy Raffetto and I, we came from the same lab at the same department at the University of Wisconsin, and she had <coughs> retrievers, um, and I had sheepdogs. So we would do this really fun demo on genetics and sort of versus training. And we were doing it at a big outdoor Scottish festival outside of Milwaukee. And it was a really fun demo in that um, I would bring my sheep and then um, the, the, the short version is, is, that, is that at one point we would throw a ball into the middle of the sheep and her dog would bust into the sheep totally ignore the sheep, take the ball, bring it back to her. And I, and I sent the border collie who would round the sheep up and bring them back to me. And it was really, a really incredibly fun demo. However, however, it did not go well this time because the sheep are out in this field, big, huge, maybe probably two, yeah, two acre field. Um, and in the back of the field was a really, really thick six foot hedge. I mean, it was basically a fence. It was like a solid green wall. Um, and I'm about to send Willie, or uh, Luke, actually, to do some cheap herding demo stuff. And behind us, a band strikes up. <laughs> so, one, <laughs> Willie can't hear me signaling him anymore because he's 100 yards away from me. The sheep panic and take off. And they start running towards the back of the field. But, you know, there's like a fence there, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm not totally worried. But I'm trying to send Willie and Willie's, or Luke. And Luke is sort of looking at me like, what? And, you know, the noise is bothering him, too. And... And so the sheep get to the hedge fence, except they disappear inside Mm -hmm. of it. It's an Alice in Wonderland moment where they literally go through the hedge fence and disappear. (laughs) And so Nancy is on the microphone, and so she's talking to this crowd of like, you know, 200 people, two, 300 people. And I run 200 yards across the field, (laughs) and I find a little hole in this hedge fence, and I crawl through, and literally like Alice in Wonderland, I am in a suburb. I mean, I've been in this big area with fields and open ground, and I'm I'm now in a suburb. (laughs) And how many sheep have we lost here in the suburb? And so they're, yeah, so they're like, you know, they're five sheep, right? (laughs) And so I literally, I'm like looking down the streets and the sidewalks and the porches and, you know, the beautiful (laughs) houses. And I finally see my sheep about a block away on somebody's porch, literally. (laughs) So me and Luke go get the sheep, and I'm like, terrified and panicked like my heart is beating out of my chest so I so Luke and I get the sheep back towards the hedge where of course they don't want to go because you know now they're not terrified anymore and it's a hedge fence right why would they go through that right so I'm trying to get them through the hedge fence and they go there's a house right next door and they run into the garage so they're now in somebody's I'm not making this up they're in somebody's garage and so I'm like okay this is great so so panicking, um, I, I, me and Luke go in to push them out of the garage, and, lo- and we sort of knock some stuff over, <laughs> and there's this noise, and then amazingly, I get the sheep out of the garage, and right before I did get them to push through the fence to go back into the field, I literally hear, Edith, there's sheep in the garage. <laughs> and, the, and, and as I'm going through the fence, I hear, oh, Harvey. <laughs> and I and we get back into the field. There's nobody there. It's been like 20 minutes, right? There's nobody there. <laughs> Nancy's sort of sitting in the car, going like, "Well, you know, I talked for as long as I could." <laughs> so there you are. There's my finest demonstration experience. And I'm feeling sorry for Harvey because now there were no sheep in the garage. And so she's like, gosh, he's always making up these stories. <laughs> Edith is never going to believe Harvey again. No. Nope. Yeah, that, that's very Poor Harvey. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Harvey. Oh, Edith, there's sheep in the well, garage. Well, oh, that's, that's so hysterical. the question is, did she say on the microphone? So the lesson of this is that you should have a golden retriever because presumably <laughs> her dog got the ball and came back. <laughs> Oh, I never, you know, yeah, we just drove back feeling like, you know, pretty much idiots. <laughs> Strangely, we weren't asked to come back the next year. Really? I find that surprising. I would have thought there would have been, you know, comedy fest. I know, all over us, right? Now, That's right. I'm sure you guys have a story on your, you know, your watch that you did something that maybe didn't quite go as you planned. 
Oh, oh mm. <laughs> gee, uh, <laughs> where do I begin? Is more like it. Um, I just, yeah. You know, the, the thing that's always um, a, a favorite for me is is one thing I, I I refuse to do is take my dog to class and use my dog as a demo dog. I will use the dogs in class as a demo dog, and that's got yeah, a certain yeah. amount of uncertainty to it. And I remember one beginning class, I was trying to teach down. I mean, which is, you know, pretty easy, basic thing. I had five dogs. I couldn't get a single one to lay down. And I'm like, really, this works. You just get to try it at home. You know, I, I'm luring forwards. I'm luring backwards. We're doing, we're doing, everybody's doing play bows. You're getting up. They're going here. I couldn't even get the little ones to lure them underneath my leg, you know, and have them lay down. And I was like, that's it. I'm just, I'm just going to resign five dogs. I couldn't get a single one to lay down. Um, it's not happened to me either before or since I can at least usually get one dog to lay down and can you, but no, they were all like, it's like they'd all talk to each other before class. Yeah. And a little passive decided. resistance. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So yeah, that was and the, and the owners are all like, we're paying how much for this? <laughs> So that was, that was one that comes to mind. I have a down story. When I started training, I was 25 years old and extremely shy and did no public speaking whatsoever, but I totally loved dogs. So it was worth it to me to get over my tremendous crippling fear to talk to people about dogs. So I had this like, you know, like, okay, and now we're going to do this, you know, whatever the class was. And I was all nervous. And so in my second set of eight classes, so I've been a dog trainer now for, you know, a few months, um, <laughs> I'm trying to get a St. Bernard to lie down. And I was teaching in a, in a county park, and it's spring in Virginia, which means it's muddy. So I'm trying to get the St. Bernard to lie down, and I'm trying to lure him down. And I lose my balance and start to slide, and I wind up splatting completely on my back, lying in the mud, <laughs> with the St. Bernard standing over me, looking curiously down at me, like, Ooh, what happened here? <laughs> and it was humiliating. Like, could you please just suck me into the earth, and I could die right now. That would be okay. But I had to get up, covered in mud, and keep teaching class. And... It was actually a really good pivotal moment for me because I was like, you know what? It's okay. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. You the can pe- live through that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The people Nothing didn't happened. all take their dogs and go home. They didn't all, you know. But it was so embarrassing and, of course, wet and uncomfortable and icky. <laughs> yes. And they probably, but, you know, it probably actually from their perspective, even though they were sympathetic, that, you know, a lot of times things like that can sort of break the ice and yeah. and I think mm-hmm. I think I've heard a lot of I mean, how many times have you heard dog owners say, Oh, you mean that happens to you too? Yeah. Or, or you mean you've made that mistake too? It's mm-hmm. like you know, dog trainers the best dog trainer, the best animal trainer in the world still messes up, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh um, yeah. And I it's such a relief I think for some dog owners to be like, you know, um, your dog does that? It's like, yep. Yep. <laughs> yep, they do. They sure do. <laughs> we they don't sure do. expect your dogs to be... Every, people apologize to you all the time. And I'm always going to be oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. So sorry, you know, he's not well-behaved. I'm like, he doesn't have his teeth in my thigh. I don't care if he's <laughs> peeing on my leg, but he doesn't have his teeth in my thigh. So anything else is great. <laughs> you know, if your dog is overly friendly and he's jumping up, yay who for that. If you don't <laughs> oh, want yeah. him to do it, I'll teach you how not to, but I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and the people are like, because uh, it, 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 we talked about that, I think, in, in, a, in, a, in a past podcast, is is that there's this part of me that's like, I get that, that you don't want the dog to do this, but yay, you have a social dog. And it's... Um, <laughs> you have a friendly dog. <laughs> Yeah. And and that's that's key. So what I find too is that is that when I'm doing a lot of behavior consults and, and most of the stuff that comes across my desk is aggressive behavior modification that people want. You know, my dog, you know, bit the neighbor or my dog did this or my dog's reactive on leash. And you know, I will take those cases, but I got to tell you every once in a while when you get that dog that's just a puppy and it's a great dog and just needs some training, how much more I enjoy having the non difficult dog that it, it some ways that I, I love working with the, with the dogs that are difficult because so many people are like, 
I, I don't know what to do. And if I can make a change in their life and help them to have a dog Absolutely. that can function yeah. in society, I'm happy to do that. But it does become so joyful for me to have a client that doesn't have a serious problem. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's really fun. And then, but it does also helps me keep perspective too, because after a while you begin to think that it's normal for dogs to, you know, have these, uh, traumatic or not traumatic, but these, you know, difficult, fearful or, or aggressive moments. And it's, it's always good to be reminded that it doesn't have to be that way or what the objective is that you would prefer to have in your dog. But Oh, I think that's such a good point. You know, I think there's a phenomenon that's that's almost universal among people who specialize in serious behavioral problems is we start, we get more and more thoughtful, and you could even say cautious about greeting dogs we don't know, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and so, you know, we would sort of never all, it doesn't take very long, if you, you, you would never barrel up to a dog you've never met, no. right? No. You know, um, but, but people who don't have our experience. So we sort of end up becoming more cautious you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> because, That's right. because you know what can happen if you're not right. Cause you sort of see mm -hmm. it all the time. And, you know, so I've, I've been amused. I've been with friends who are like, Oh, look at that sweet dog. And they sort of run over there and the dog is fine. The dog's yeah. like, yay, do whatever you want. I'm okay. And part of me is know. just holding my breath. <gasps> exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, ah. <laughs> It's true. It's true. Well, I have a I have a um a story I think is funny anyway. Um, um, obviously the the proof is in the pudding here. You guys can decide. But this is from my radio show. I did a radio show with Larry Mueller on Wisconsin Public Radio called "Calling All Pets" for twenty five. No, no, um, no, more like fifteen years or so. And so people often ask me like, "Who was your favorite caller?" And so, so I don't know. I, I don't know why I was singing about this um, just yesterday, but I was. So, so people could call in with questions about behavior, um, and it wasn't just um, dogs and cats. It was any animal at all, which made it really extra fun. So this guy calls me from Georgia, and he loves to feed birds, and he has a big, huge bird feeder that's hanging in a pine tree. And it gets raided by a black bear. So the black, which is really common, bears love bird seed. So this black bear is like, you know, swiping down this bird feeder and eating all the seed. And the guy didn't want it to happen anymore. So his question was, he said, if I get a ladder and put it against the tree and then urinate on the tree really high up, <laughs> will that make him think I'm a big, huge mammal and he'll stay away from the tree? <laughs> and after a moment of stunned silence, I said, I'll tell you what, send me a video. <laughs> and, 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 and I'll send it to an expert in bear behavior. <laughs> oh my God. And I just, this image of this guy crawling up a ladder and then mm -hmm. urinating on his tree, it's just, it's never left me. <laughs> no. Sometimes you just can't unsee things, you know? Indeed. Even, even things you haven't actually seen, you can't unsee. Even things you haven't actually Yeah, <laughs> our brains are so good at creating images to go with words. Wow. We fill in the details. I, I, I have not had that question, um, but uh, that's, a, that's a good one. Well, someday you might. Someday I might. You might. <laughs> now, now you're ready, right? I, I, yeah. So did he send, my question, did he send you the video? I never got, no, he didn't. Oh, oh no. too bad. Nope. So, but I, but I did talk to a, a, a expert in bears. Oh, I can't remember his name. I'm so sorry. Um, Dr. X, I talked to Dr. X here at University of Wisconsin, um, and, and sort of jokingly told him that. And he said, nah, sorry. <laughs> I don't think it's going to help any. <laughs> well, for one thing, I think urine between species is just not nearly as effective as urine in any given species. So Within species, yes. Yeah. Good, uh, so. And, and good, good for all of us to remember. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> often thinking of, of all of the examples of... You know, that surely that makes sense in our dominance theories. Although yes. I will, I will. That actually makes me think of of something that is important. When um, 
One of my dogs is Maggie. She's a now five-year-old Border Collie. We got her when she was 14 months old. And um, she was one of those dogs who, she basically needed to learn to pee on cue. And so we're at a place we'd never been before, a friend's cabin in the woods, and we wanted to get unpacked and get inside, but I wanted her, for obvious reasons, to pee before we went mm-hmm. inside. Obvious mm-hmm. reasons, right? Well, and she just... She she wouldn't. She's just so she was just so into her nose and trying. You know, she's just too nervous. As I'm guessing, but certainly overwhelmed by sort of all these this, you know this new sensory experience. And so I said, Jim, help me out here. So Jim, <laughs> a guy, right? So he goes over, right? Yeah, you got it. So Jim mm-hmm. goes over. Mm-hmm. He's next to the tree, right? Maggie comes over. He's right on it. <laughs> good so for Maggie. I, I and good for Jim. Yes. <laughs> so, so a couple of while while Maggie was in the sort of learning process, you know, as she was adapting to a new, new life with us, you know, we'd get out of the car and I just sort of looked. You know, like, at first it was like Jim, would you? And then it was just Jim, and then it was just like I just look at him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to say that Maggie no longer needs a prompt. That's um, so good. But yeah, yeah, but, it's kind of like oh, it's like that the the lure reward system, you know that uh, that's the lure yeah. for him, for her. Yeah, and, yeah. So now you can just I go mean, to a strict you know. reward based system. So. Yeah, and so nice that Jim was willing to help because it'd be a lot more awkward if you had had to do it. This is a no kidding. <laughs> this, this is definitely a good guy. <laughs> this is yeah. a good husband to keep. Although I, I do have a somewhat similar story that also <laughs> happened this weekend. Uh, I had a friend come out for um, part of the weekend, and we walked around the lake, and we got to a point, and I I needed to use the facilities, and there were none except that there were woods. So um, I dropped the leash on the Bernese Mountain Dog and went over and did my duty and as i was walking away who should go over but sniff at it and lift his leg no, <laughs> so yep. um, it can yep. work the other way as well just fyi so it, it's, um, yes even between species it's still relevant well yes. i guess now we have to go back and say maybe your bear advice wasn't as good as we think because maybe yeah, he really should have gotten the ladder maybe yeah. he should have gotten the ladder yeah. well anybody seems to work for dogs if you have a bear <laughs> Eating your bird seed. Um, we are asking for a video and for. <laughs> well, the other thing Just is, I it. wonder is 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 that is it urine? Okay, I, I still am not convinced that urine between species is generally as much of a prompt as perhaps it was in these two particular instances. Could it have been because we were familiar to these dogs that this urine became of interest? You know Could that. Have- that- That actually raises a really interesting question. I'm just, I'm working on a talk that I'm going to give in Mexico City. If I can call it up here right now really quickly, I can tell you the name of the researcher, but here's the research that that you are reminding me of. Um, A researcher looked at where dogs, so imagine a dog being approached by a person. Um, The person could be familiar or the person could be unfamiliar, okay? Mm -hmm. And so they basically um, mapped where dogs sniff, um, people who are familiar and unfamiliar. And and so it is um, Filiatre um, who did this research in 1981. And so, so basically... People who are familiar get sniffed all over a sp- their feet, which is like, where have you been? Right? Mm-hmm. It took mm-hmm. me a while to figure out why Maggie was sniffing down the driveway. She's sniffing the tires. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. What information have you brought in on the tires? So they they sniff the feet of unfamiliar people, and um, and legs, and lots and lots and lots around the hands and arms. Unfamiliar people, not almost nothing on the feet. And a ton of concentration on the crotch. Mm-hmm. Huh. So yeah, yeah. And just like dogs sniff unfamiliar dogs. So I think they can get a lot of information from urine, even from other species, um, especially species that they consider to be part of their social system. Mm-hmm. So there you are. You know, science comes yeah. comes to the rescue yet again. That's interesting. 
One interesting scary. sniffing thing at my house is I currently have only one dog. And when I come back, I get different inspections. So ordinary go to the grocery store inspection is, oh, hi, you're home. <laughs> dog class inspection is sort of the sniffing oh. of the feet and the hands. Yeah. But a dog that had issues, any dog that had me going, oh, be careful, I get what we call the full inspection. Like there is oh. sniffing and nudging and huh. who... Who have you been there? And it's really interesting. That is really interesting. That is interesting because what I'm wondering is is two things. On the full inspection, is he picking up your pheromones? I don't know. And two, is he picking up the stress pheromones of the other dog? Because in general, you know... And who knows? I mean, it, it depends a little bit on... Um, usually, if I'm dealing with aggressive dogs, I'm not doing a lot of cuddling. Um, no. You know, I'm not touching the dog nearly as much. So that makes me wonder if my dog is picking up on my own stress hormones mm-hmm. and and pheromones that I'm releasing. That's, and wondering, that's a wow. great question. Yeah, yeah and no, Edza won't really tell really, me. Was, I've asked him. Oh, there's a, you know, there's a research project just waiting to happen, right? You know? Yeah, that is. It that has is. been interesting, too. There have been a couple of dogs where I, where I, in the appointment, have had mixed feelings, where I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, I think he's, like, on the edge. He's maybe not that bad. And, and then I come home and I get the inspection, and I'm like, oh, oh. Eat, yo. <laughs> Thank you, Enzo. Ah. I am no yeah. longer on the fence. <laughs> That's very interesting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I find in some ways, those are the clients, um, it, it, people say, well, you know, it's, it's such a happy job. I'm like, yeah, you sit and counsel somebody about their aggressive dog and lay out the options that you see are available. You know, this dog has bitten multiple times and fights with the other dog in the household. And um, they're talking about rehoming. I'm like, who? Who's going to take this dog? Yeah. Um, and yeah. those, are, those are tough. Situation. But the other ones that are tough are the ones that Colleen was just saying that you just don't know that are are on that cusp. Is this a dog that has serious, are we heading towards really serious problems? Can we rein it back? You know, those in some ways are the hardest ones that um, I'm, I'm less sort of convinced that this is either something we can manage or something that is, is, beyond the scope of what most people can do so there's some there's some tough aspects to being a trainer to try and and guide these people into you know making a decision that's right for them and um, I learned from a vet um, at the Midwestern Veterinary Conference a couple years ago I've got this in mind is he said you cannot be the ones to tell somebody if they need to put their dog down or not you can give Mm -hmm. them your counsel but there oh, may yeah. be a there may be a reason why they're not going to put that dog down that you don't know about. And it was shortly after that I was working with a woman who had a very aggressive dog, and um, I just wasn't sure what we were going to do. And her brother had some special needs, and she said, "I can't put this dog down because." My brother relates to this dog. This dog has special needs and nobody understands him, just like he has special needs and nobody understands Mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. And if I put this dog down, it would be the same thing as saying to my brother, you're not worth working on either. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. And I was so grateful for that, that telling me you can't make this decision for other people. Because well, I yeah, I, and I think that just should be standard in the industry. I mean, it's it is not our dog, and it's not you know it's not appropriate for anybody in any kind of advice related profession to say this is what you should do. Um, mm-hmm. It's just not you know, and I will I I certainly will develop my own opinion, um, but I always talk to people about the three alternatives. You know, you have three, you have at least three alternatives. One is to you know, do behavior mod, do management. Um, you know, one is to rehome the dog and one is to euthanize the dog. And um, it's never our decision. So I think, you know, right. yay for the vet for saying that, yay for you for picking up on it because it's absolutely critical. Um, it's it's simply not our decision. It's, you know, we it's not professional to pretend that it is. So good for you. Yeah. Um, and are, are we circling back to 
gold retriever puppies in Fields I and Daisy? I hope so. I think so. <laughs> I was I thinking think we I might need to wrap up with what we like best about working with families and dogs because we may have just scared all of our listeners away. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know what I love best? I love best is is the fact that in some ways what we have is a quiet little profession that makes a huge difference in the life of a person and an animal and a family that if you have a dog that has a problem or it needs some training or whatever, that can be all encompassing of your life. And if you're committed to keeping that dog for the duration, then the fact that we can go in and give you some skills and some tools to make that duration happy to me, that's huge. And it seems very tiny, but it's not because I'm making a difference in the happiness of an animal and a family for perhaps as long as 10 years. And so, yeah, I'm not changing the world, but I may be changing one dog and one family at a time. And to me, that's why I stay with it. And that's the real joy of it all. Well, that's just beautiful. And I that's think awesome. I mean, it, it's so true is, you know, I talk to trainers a lot about there may not be a lot of social status in being a dog trainer, or you know, even a, even frankly, even a PhD animal behaviorist. Um, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, what we do is really, really, really important because it it has a profound effect on health and safety and longevity. Um, so so here here to everything you said. What I guess what I would add is that. One of the things that, that fuels me that is really important to me is being aware and appreciating and understanding the connection that we have, as humans have with all the rest of nature. That you know, mm-hmm. and my belief is that is that we are not sort of these separate. There's not this category of nature and then humans. You know, is, is that we are very much a part mm-hmm. of it, and and losing as we have, much of that feeling of connection has been, um, and I mean, there have been all kinds of amazingly wonderful things that have come from it, the fact that we are special. Um, but, you know, being special also means that you're different and you're alone. And I think what dogs do is they create this connection for us. You know, we may be special, but we're not alone. They are a bridge to the rest of the natural world to us. It's so important. And I think keeping that bridge, whether wherever you live, whether it's in the country or, or in an apartment in New York City, I think dogs as a bridge to the rest of the natural world, I think is profoundly important and meaningful in our lives. Mm-hmm. Very well said. Thank you. I, yeah. I feel very much the same way too. And that's kind of thing Colleen and I have touched on before, but you said it far more eloquently than I think we I think the did. two of you sound like <laughs> you're philosophers and and I just like roll along just doing my dog training stuff. <laughs> oh, Garth, you're just a yeah. lawyer. <laughs> but I think, I think really... it's really true. And yeah. what both of yeah. you said really um, resonates with why we have animals in our lives and, and why it matters so much to us that we have good relationships with them and that they themselves are happy, that we want our mm-hmm. pets to be happy. And that matters deeply to us for all of the reasons you said of, of the connection and the community aspects of it. We should have a trainer, a national trainers appreciation day. We should. (laughs) Here we are. Let's, let's decide that's today. (laughs) Today. Okay. So we will be celebrating it again next January. I don't know when this episode will be released, but January 31st is national (laughs) dog trainer appreciation day. Day. Trish McConnell declared it. So, and I'm posting it on Facebook when we get off the phone. (laughs) <laughs> we are. Go buy some chocolate. <laughs> that's yes. right. One for me, one for uh, for Zuzu. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's great. I like the National Dog Trainer Appreciation Day. And we, you know, maybe if we're lucky, we can work it into a week, and then it can become a month. And there you, you know. Go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Trisha, thank you so much for joining us. Um, loved your stories. Um, your books are terrific. I recommend. Um, any and all of your books um, I, for our listeners, um, just pick one up and start reading. It doesn't matter in some ways which one you pick up. They're all terrific. Um, her most current one, of course, is The Education of Will, which has just recently come out in paperback and uh, is, a, is a wonderfully 
connected book and well written, and I really enjoyed it. Enjoyed all of them. So thank you so much thank for you. writing. Thank you, and thanks for having me. It's been great fun. It's always fun to talk to you too. I always learn something, and I always have a good time. So thanks for well, asking great. me. Well, great. Thank again. you. All right. I'm so thank glad you. you could come. Take care. Thanks for listening to Your Family Dog. Got questions? Interesting ideas? Colleen and Julie would love to hear them. Call 614-349-1661 or visit www.yourfamilydogpodcast.com to share your thoughts.